because we don't need a permit to podcast. This is MuggleCast episode 226 for April 26th, 2011. This week's episode of MuggleCast is brought to you by Audible.com, the Internet's leading provider of audiobooks with more than 75,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature, including fiction, nonfiction, and periodicals. For a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash MuggleCast. And by Hypable.com, a MuggleNet for the rest of the fandoms in the world and created by MuggleNet staff, Visit Hypable.com for thorough and up-to-the-minute coverage around The Hunger Games, Glee, Doctor Who, The Hobbit, and many more. That's Hypable.com. H-Y-P-A-B-L-E.com. Welcome to MuggleCast episode 226. It's almost kind of a reunion. I actually, when I mentioned who was on the show this week to other people, multiple people, they were like, ooh. Ooh, no kidding. Oh, wow, wow. Laura and Jamie are both on the show this week. Hey, guys. Welcome hey. back. Hey, Andrew. Hey. It's we been a while. Kevin Steck now, don't we? <laughs> oh, my God. Is he still alive? Um, I Like, I checked a year ago, and yeah. <laughs> yeah. I saw him, actually, in New York uh, in November. Me and Micah both saw him. How he is was, he? He's doing well. Yeah. What is he doing now? I don't know. <laughs> I actually found him. He was, he was in a box on the street. I just is happened he- to run into him. Uh, is he a spy of some sort? <laughs> no, I was implying he's homeless. But <laughs> oh, right. I... <laughs> no, he's he's not homeless. He's doing fine. Uh, but yeah, so we got a lot to talk about this week. The the Deathly Hallows Part One DVD came out, and we're already looking forward to Part Two. Uh, well, Mike, get get us through the news. We'll we'll get everybody updated. I'm Andrew Sims. I'm Jamie Lawrence. I'm Laura Thompson. And I'm Micah Tannenbaum. I had no idea how to do that order. Micah, what's in the news? Yeah, I know. I almost <laughs> forgot to even do the intro. I was, I was going to say to you, I'm like, you're Andrew Sims. Mm. You always, we always forget. But yeah. So, Andrew, uh, apparently the Deathly Hallows Part 2 teaser trailer is going to be debuting this Wednesday on ABC Family. Yeah, it's about time. But, well, okay, you wrote teaser trailer in the news post, but it doesn't. I didn't see any mention of a teaser trailer. I'm wondering if this is the actual trailer, if they're only doing one trailer, or what? I just assumed, I guess, because it was ABC Family, it would be a teaser trailer, and not the full thing. Yeah. Well, we'll have it posted on MuggleNet when it does when when it does make its way online. It's kind of annoying that they're airing it only on U.S. television, so poor Jamie. I know he would want to tune into ABC Family, but he can't. I'm sure I could get it somehow. I'm sure I could get it. There's, I'm sure there's some internet way of doing it. I don't know. Yeah. I'm, I, or or some, you know, satellite dish something. <laughs> but that's quite so a lot of effort. Stream, just to watch. Yeah. Someone's right. pro- probably going to post it online. So <laughs> exactly. that's probably an easier way of me seeing it. YouTube's the answer to every bag. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Wednesday night during Happy Gilmore. From oh, great. seven to nine o'clock. So I know you, if you haven't gotten your uh, your share of Adam Sandler this month, I haven't seen Bob that film. Barker. So I guess I'll be forced to watch it. You now. haven't seen Happy Gilmore? No. Oh. Is it terrible? Jamie, Laura. Oh, I'm uh, not seeing. No, it. I think I'll just wait for it to hit YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> That's a funny movie. He beats up, or actually, Bob Barker beats up him. Anyway. All right. Well, what else is going on? Well, you just uh, you mentioned earlier Deathly Hallows Part 1 finally hit DVD and Blu-ray. It was released on April the 15th. And, uh, you know, all the deleted scenes really made their way online before uh, the DVD went on sale. So uh, we, we've been holding off a little bit on discussing them. Uh, what, what were your guys' overall thoughts with some of them? You know, like for the first time on a DVD, it seemed like there were scenes that were actually... People actually wish they had actually been in the final cut of the film, particularly Harry and Petunia's little talk in the Dursley house before the Dursleys leave. That moved a lot of people. Yeah, and it was very well done, too. I mean, it wasn't... I I kind of felt that the whole scene with Harry and Dudley shaking hands was a little cheesy, Um, so I understand why they cut that, but... Mm -hmm. As per the Harry and Petunia scene, I don't know, it was 20 seconds. I think they maybe could have included it. 
Yeah. It's quite a canon thing, though. I think big fans really, really like it, but perhaps other people wouldn't mm-hmm. appreciate it so much. I think they should have kept it in there, yeah. It, that was awkward, though. I don't, I don't know why they did that the way that they did with uh, Dudley walking. Like, he had something in his pants, or, you know, like, almost <laughs> like he had, a, he, did look, he, he had to take a dump. If he I'm did honest. look constipated. Yeah. And it was really awkward. Um, but, but yeah. It, it, in the maximum movie mode feature on the DVD, there was, um, I think either Heyman, I think it was Heyman, he talked about why they took that little scene out, uh, between, uh, uh, Mrs. Dursley and, uh, Harry, because it sort of, you know, it always comes down to the pacing. It disrupted the pacing because he said if they had kept that in, it would have taken away from the fact that something is about to happen. And the whole point of the intro of the film was to make it feel like something was brewing, something was going on. And that took away from it. So that was their excuse for cutting that out. I don't know if I agree with it. I mean, I understand that because if you watch the first, you know, five to seven minutes of the film, it is very fast paced. And that scene, I think, would have probably taken it down a notch. So I get why they did it. Um, I don't think that the pacing thing was just an excuse. I think pacing was an excuse when it came to the sixth film. But um, with this one, I thought they did a really good job with it. So I don't know. I understand. I, I mm-hmm. get that sacrifices have to be made. Mm-hmm. This is a lesson I've learned. I used to be one of those people who complained about everything, but... <laughs> <laughs> you threw in the towel. Yeah. WB, um, WB1. It could also be just because, though, that they haven't developed the relationship that exists between Harry and Petunia very much throughout you know, the, too. the films. Well, and they've completely neglected the Dursleys in, like, the last three films, so... Yeah. I mean, it yeah. it would have seemed kind of strange. Well, how did that play out, though, Andrew, during The Prince's Tale? Did they show Petunia at all? No. No, they didn't. Really? So, oh, my no. God. That was the one scene. And again, that's the one scene. Well, I can't completely confirm that because that was the scene I went to the bathroom during. So I don't know. Well, you went and, to the bathroom? Yeah, I had to. Andrew. Like, really bad. Because I thought I would rather go during The Prince's Tale then during like Harry and Voldemort fighting, I wanted to make sure I didn't miss that. Can you, you just pause it? it. Like, or... Wait, no, no, it was it was a part two screen. Oh, sorry, oh, I got really Chicago. confused. Chicago, yeah. oh, right, yeah. Oh, no, Why okay. didn't you just hold it then? Yeah, yeah I, I could. I was about to explode, guys. Leave me alone. Everybody's disappointed. <laughs> so, so wait, Angie. So wait, is it good then? Yeah, it was. It was really good. A lot of the special effects weren't finished, so I'm like, re- I'm really looking forward to seeing it again because so. What's it like when you see a film where they haven't been finished? Is it just like in? Is it just like an outline? Or no, it, no, it's it's pretty finished. It's just a lot of the special effects that aren't done. So like the dragon, for example, some scenes uh, either you didn't see the dragon or the dragon was like half complete. So it's like somebody walking around in a costume or something. No, <laughs> <laughs> like I'm the dragon. Barney the no. dinosaur is like out there walking around. <laughs> yeah. in that place filler. <laughs> Yeah, it, it was an interesting way to see the film because it's kind of like a behind-the-scenes look at the the process that goes into it. So it was, you know, it, it was good though. For example, and I brought this up on uh, uh, Eric and I brought this up on an earlier episode. Uh, Snape, for whatever reason, Alan Rickman wasn't ever uh, wasn't able to shed a tear when he was dying in the uh, you know as Snape. So the tear wasn't added yet. So they added a caption at the bottom that says Snape sheds a tear. And it just made the audience That's roar weird. with Isn't laughter. That weird? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh so these deleted scenes, any other ones that stood out to anyone? Not I really there were a couple of them that I didn't I mean I didn't really understand what the point of them was, like Ron and Hermione skipping rocks, like Harry and Ron chasing rabbits. Like I get they were trying to establish <laughs> You know, they were bored. Yeah, and they <laughs> were trying to establish... Issues. Yeah, I know. They were like trying to establish the aggression between Harry and Ron and the romance between Ron and Hermione, but I thought those things were both very evident already, and I don't know. I'm like, okay, so they're out there like bounty hunting rabbits now. I don't, I don't get it, and I'm really glad that wasn't yeah. in the movie. Actually, I thought the one with them skipping stones, that was very like, that kind of fed into the Ron and Hermione shippers. I thought they may have really appreciated that. Yeah, I mean, it was a really nice scene. Like, it was well done, and it was very sweet, but I don't think they needed it. What about uh, Yaxley searching Hermione's parents' home? Eh. Okay. I mean, just okay. But yeah, I mean, it was just him taking five steps, looking around, and looking like, hmm. 
what's going on here yeah exactly (laughs) can you imagine if they just kept it's like what a 15 second clip like it's not that long if they had just kept that and just randomly inserted it somewhere in the middle of the movie yeah it i I wouldn't have yeah i think it it just wouldn't have made it just would have been weird well i mean definitely the one that sticks out is the one that we first mentioned with uh petunia because if you really can't remember like i can't even right now what the other deleted scenes were then it's probably good that they left them out of the film yeah Anyways, uh, another big feature on the on the Blu-ray version was the maximum movie mode. And this was actually really cool because what happens is throughout the movie, you're watching it and the, the movie will kind of zoom out and uh, the, 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 the movie will kind of move to the bottom right corner of the screen. And then one of the actors or crew members will kind of talk about what's going on. It's kind of like a commentary, but then they'll also add another video window onto the screen and you see like behind the scenes footage and one of the best parts of it was they showed uh when the final shot ever for harry potter was being filmed uh, like in terms of the filming process not like the last shot in part two but like in terms of their filming schedule um they showed footage from like when they were finished and like um emma and rupert were crying and everybody was applauding like it was very emotional and they showed footage of like the little celebration that they had so it was really cool and they kind of included a couple deleted scenes and explained why they weren't included. So that was really good. And I, I wish I wish they had started doing these maximum movie modes earlier because they're actually I watched it with my friends at a party a couple of weeks ago. And it was really fun to watch and then like talk about with everybody. So that's cool. If you have, yeah, well, Emma if, and Rupert were only crying because they thought that was their last scene they were going to shoot then they found right. out they had to do the epilogue again <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Drat. <laughs> yeah. all that crying for nothing yeah. now we have to cry again <laughs> if you have a blu-ray definitely check it out yeah so that's what i was just going to say it's just for the blu-ray right yeah I, I mean you know and if you don't have blu-ray at this point you're just living in the 90s so <clears throat> hey i don't it's even have a with it. dvd what? player I don't, what i don't even have a dvd player your laptop doesn't no, play no, DVDs? No, 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 I've got that. I mean, I just don't have a DVD player connected to the to the uh, TV. Oh, yeah. Hey, yeah, hey, I don't, I don't have this. one either. We don't even have a TV license. We don't what even, do you mean? Well, we just... What, there's this thing, I probably shouldn't admit this, because this is uh, f- TV fraud, but like we sometimes watch stuff on iPlayer, like, you know... Um, yeah. Do you know what iPlayer well, What's is? a TV license? Like, in America, you need a license to kill, but why would you need a license... You don't need a, a license, license to watch TV. To watch... To, to watch no. Like, what? Well, I mean, I need, you need a subscription to a cable service. Yes, but Andrew, but Andrew, if you don't have cable, what happens if you just want like a standard amount of channels? Like, what? What's the standard amount of channels if you don't? You buy an antenna and you get like the networks, the big networks. Yeah. Okay. So you don't have to pay for that. No. Uh, no. What? That's ridiculous. <laughs> we have to no, pay like this is ridiculous. <laughs> no, we have to pay like two hundred. No, no, one hundred and thirty pounds a year. For the, for the privilege of watching a television, or wow. yeah, yeah, or you can not pay that and do something good with your life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's odd. Yeah, no, no license here. But anyway, what were we even talking about? Oh, so Jamie is a, <laughs> Jamie. Jamie lives in the Stone Age. He does have a DVD player for a TV. <laughs> <laughs> but saying that, saying that, we do have a VHS player. Do you still remember oh, great. what those are, Andrew? Do you know what they are? Yeah, uh, part one is coming out on VHS uh, never. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> We've got those, and we buy a load of videos from charity shops and car boot sales because they're like six for a pound. So you just watch right. them and then get rid of them, and then it's a kind of, hmm. you know, barter, Circle barter of life. system. Circle of life, exactly, exactly. C- circle of life. However, you you don't get the maximum movie mode on VHS. <laughs> really? <laughs> so, I thought you just supported that. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, you don't know. That's the only bad thing. Before we continue with today's show, we'd like to remind everybody that this podcast is brought to you by Audible.com, the Internet's leading provider of audiobooks with more than 75,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature and featuring audio versions of many New York Times bestsellers. For listeners of this podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook to give you a chance to try out their great service. One audiobook to consider is A Game of Thrones, A Song of Ice and Fire, Book One. It's a very popular book on Audible, and a television adaptation recently debuted on HBO called Game of Thrones. The first episode was actually so successful that HBO has already renewed it for a second season. 
So for a free audiobook of your choice, such as A Game of Thrones, go to audiblepodcast.com slash mugglecast. That's audiblepodcast.com slash mugglecast. All right. So uh, moving on in the news, Electronic Arts released the Deathly Hallows Part 2 video game trailer and a couple of new photos. And uh, I took a look at the trailer and, you know, I've never been big on on EA's video games. And I have to say, this trailer does not really make me want to play this game. I don't know (laughs) if anybody else has watched it, but it's really not cut that well, to be honest. Yeah, it's kind of, you know, we've talked about this before. It seems like the Deathly Hallows video games are, or the Harry Potter video games, they're never good. And we've always been disappointed with each one that comes out. And I'm sure part two will be no different. Yeah. I mean, the footage is cool, but... It's hmm. cool. I I think part of the problem is, and we've discussed this many times, is that it needed to be more of a role-playing game and having sort of free-roaming ability to go different places within the world. And really, which the Lego Harry Potter does let you do, but this these series of games just don't, don't allow for that. And so while you might be seeing a really cool scene on the trailer, you don't necessarily get to play that scene in the game. If that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Well, and speaking as someone I know, who Laura, is you've played kind it too. of, yeah, I was a video game nerd when I was younger, and I probably got, I, I would get the Harry Potter games up until I was about like fourteen or so, and um, they were really easy. Like I would beat them in less than a day. Like <laughs> I would sit downstairs for like four hours and be like, "Okay, I'm done." <laughs> so you know, yeah. I was homeschooled. I didn't have anything better to do. Um, yeah. But yeah. So, I don't know. They probably need to be a bit more challenging, too. Yeah. Yeah. And I think from what I've heard, just the stories aren't that good. And, well, whatever. I mean, we'll try not to talk about this one much over the coming months because we've always been disappointed. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Jamie, do you need a license to play video games at the end? <laughs> I don't know. I don't play any. <laughs> mm. Do you go uh, to the arcade? Well, well, saying that, I, I do go to the, uh, like, penny arcades you know i don't mean like yeah. with big digital screens and stuff i mean where you put a 2p in and it goes down to the bottom and then it pushes it and do you know what i mean and then it pushes the right 2P like off. like ski ball i don't i don't know do you remember ski ball i don't know no, i don't know uh i don't no. think it has a specific name oh or it has like a generic name but anyway i've gone to those sometimes i quite like okay. those but um you don't need a license. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> All what right. else is going on, Mike? All right. Final piece of news. Uh, in a new article by Movie Line, uh, J.K. Rowling revealed how apprehensive she was at handing the keyboard over to screenwriter Steve Clovis for the movie adaptation of Her Magical World. And I'm reading a post by Keith Hawk here. <laughs> uh, no, I, I mean, I think we're starting to see a lot of these articles now that the series is winding down or getting more insight into how this all got created in the first place. So, you know, uh, J.K. Rowling was just talking about, you know, what it's like. I'm sure it must have been, at least early on, pretty scary to hand this work over that you've been working on for pretty much your entire adult life to somebody who you don't know. And, yeah. You know, here's what she's, here's yeah, what ahead. she said. She said, Steve turned to me while food was being ordered and said quietly, you know who my favorite character is? I looked at him, red hair included, and I thought, you're going to say Ron. Please, please don't say Ron. Ron's so easy to love. And he said, Hermione. At which point, under my standoffish, mistrusting exterior, I just melted. Because if he got Hermione, he got the books. He also, to a large extent, got me. I think that sounds like the kind of story that you come up with after the event that sounds really good, you know. I don't. I just don't know if you can say that from one word. Isn't this old news, though? I feel like we've heard this story before, like a long time ago. Really? Yeah. Well, it definitely happened a long time ago. I don't know. This was a new interview she's doing. Yeah. Uh, in for a uh, publication called Written By. Mm-hmm. So there will be more. But maybe she has. I don't know. It may have been a long time ago. Yeah, well, I, I agree with Jamie, though. It does seem a bit odd that just one word, and then it's like, oh, okay. I, I, I sort of get it, because her, Hermione's a very... Hermione was a very complex character, I think. Well, and uh, she was also based on um, yeah, exactly. Joe as a kid. Rowling, yeah. So. yeah. Well, you see, Laura, the thing is, is that... You know, there's so little news about her these days that we have to start recycling things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. We should 
We should find some interviews from 98 and just start reposting them as new news. Yeah, exactly. yeah. We'll call I it bet exclusive- no one will notice. Yeah, exactly. We'll call it a new MuggleNet interview with J.K. Rowling. We'll see how far we can get. Well, we should probably do it with someone we've actually done an interview with before. <laughs> release, da- <laughs> release date for Chamber of Secrets has been announced. <laughs> 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 okay, so that's all that's in the news, Micah. That's it. All right. Uh, before we continue, we actually uh, wanna, we got a lot of emails last week. And Laura, actually, this is why it's great that you're on this episode. Part of the reason why uh, we talked about, we did a what if segment. What if Harry Potter was a girl, which we may have done before, but we wanted to do it again. And, you know, three and or I'm four sure guys. I'm sure you guys were just... <laughs> wonderful and complimentary individuals yeah we didn't please a lot of people so we'll talk about those emails in a second but first we want to remind everybody that we're going to be at leaky con 2011 going in uh, going on in orlando florida over the release of harry potter potter and the deathly hallows part two it's going to be july 13th to 17th at the Universal Orlando Resort. It's going to be a ton of fun. We're going to be doing some podcasts there, including our big movie review podcast. Uh, Micah, Eric, Ben, and I are all going to be there. It's going to be a ton of fun. There's going to be the ball. There's going to be the party in the park. There's going to, of course, be the big midnight movie release event that everybody attending LeakyCon is, of course, going to be going to. Everybody's going to be, I'm going to be sopping, uh, sobbing, sopping up Micah's tears as he's, he's rolling all over the floor in despair. <laughs> Uh, or it could just be how bad the movie is. I could be crying because <laughs> yeah. of that, too. Could be that, too. I'm kidding. Um, I'm going to be cleaning up after Eric, too. It's going to be a mess, but it's also going to be a lot of fun. So visit LeakyCon.com, and when you register, we can't wait to see you there. And also enter code MUGGLE, and that way we'll know you're coming. And more details to be announced pretty soon. We're finally going to talk to them about the podcast soon. We still haven't talked to them about that yet, but... We will be doing podcasts there. We just don't have exact details yet. What 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 day does it start? July thirteenth. So we'll let you guys know like July twelfth. <laughs> yes. What's happening? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm still kidding. I'm still plenty far away. Anyway, let's now get into those what if responses I was just talking about. Uh, this first one comes from Sophia nineteen of Seattle. She writes, "Hello. I think if Harry was female, it would be interesting to see how that would change his relationships with adult members of the series, like Snape and Sirius." Part of the reason Harry was so close with Sirius was because he reminded him so much of James. If Harry was Harrietta, as we called him last week, I don't know what they would have been. I don't know that they would have been as close. I also wonder how Snape would have acted if Harry was Harrietta and not a miniature James. Would Snape have been nicer to Harry if he was more like his mother than his father? Thanks, love your podcast, Sophia. I don't want to go here. <laughs> this sounds so <laughs> weird. <laughs> if, if if he was more like Lily uh, than Harry, then. Yeah. Then, oh. you know, the whole... It, that's very weird. I think we should move on immediately. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe this makes me think maybe he would have connected with other people, with, with female characters in the series. She would have connected with people in the fem- female characters in the series. Maybe her and McGonagall would have... Her, <laughs> Harrietta and McGonagall would have found it. <laughs> well, didn't Harry and McGonagall sort of have a bond? I mean... Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so she, she trusts him, that... and and when he says, you know, I'm here on Dumbledore's ordered orders, then she's like, yes, Potter, straight away. You know, we'll secure the castle and stuff. Yeah, Micah, could you read the next email? Sure. Next email is from Julia, fourteen of Brisbane, Australia. And she says, "Hi, Mugglecast. I think that if Harry Potter was a girl, the fandom that exists today would not have occurred." Uh, Whoa. I don't... I don't think that many people would like to read a book or see a movie about the fate of the world and its population being in the hands of a teenage girl. Ouch. (laughs) There are a few reasons for this. First of all, women are known for being able to multitask, and this could be a serious issue when trying to save the world because our heroine would continuously get sidetracked making the HB series (laughs) much longer than seven books. Second of all, we generally associate major roles of responsibility with men. For example. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> is this? Uh, oh, wait, I want to make sure this is a girl. Is this, this real? This, that... I think this is a girl. Yes, right. it's a girl. What is right. wrong with you? For example, <laughs> humans perceive God as a man and the devil as a man, also. So it seemed fitting that the hero of a story would be a guy. These are just a couple of thoughts that sprang to mind when listening to your discussion. Just wondering what your thoughts were. Julia. Well, let's get your thoughts on the table, though. What do you guys think? Would the series have been as successful? It would have been different, wouldn't it? Yeah, it it wouldn't have been 
written in the same way, but it would have been dis- just different. I, I mean, I, I'm sure. I mean, isn't the Hunger Games about a girl? Or like Twilight yes. about yeah. a girl? And you know. so is um, His Dark Materials, which was also a series being published around the same time as Harry Potter. True. So you can't really... I don't think you can measure it that way. I mean, yes, it would have been different because obviously the perspectives between a male and a female character would have been... You couldn't have written Harrietta and had her doing all the same things Harry did, obviously. Um, but to say that it wouldn't have been as successful, I think that's BS. I mean, if I'm being quite frank. Yeah. I mean, I argued on the last show, I thought that it, it probably wouldn't be as successful. I, I, I just think you would lose a very large demographic if, you know, you're, if it's a teenage girl growing up as opposed to, you know, in this case, a guy growing up. And yeah, but I, what's, I, what's the largest demographic of Harry Potter fans? Girls. So. Yeah, but, yeah. but I think it reaches, it reaches more than just that is my point. And, you know, I, I, I guess it also depends how you define successful. Like, you know, on what level? Is it going to be the billion dollar franchise it, it, it's become? No, probably not. I mean. Yeah, but that would be like saying that, I mean, okay, for instance, Chronicles of Narnia, who's the main character in that? Or at least in the, the first book? The Lion. I don't know. Wrong. Lucy, <laughs> a girl. Oh, Lucy. It's the a girl. <laughs> come wow. On, come okay. On. I thought you guys. The witch. Had the witch. You, <laughs> we're we're naming all the three things in the title. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, at any rate, I mean, those books were enormously successful and still are today. So, but, but uh, who was? They couldn't make a third film. They had to sell it to another company. Yeah. Well, that's because so. the movies were bad. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, but but the other thing to keep in mind is. At least the pup. Remember, they they had to initial they had to ch- change Joanne Kathleen Rowling to J.K. Rowling because Scholastic and Bloomsbury were concerned that uh, you know a female author would have turned people off. Now, were they right? We'll never know. But there is definitely concern in the publishing community. I think at least about a, a, a boys no, will mean, not read a, a female author's book. Right. I'm not denying the fact that there's gender bias. I mean, yes, that exists in our world, and certainly. Um, because of certain perspectives, like uh, with all due respect, Julia, I think you are unfortunately, um, holding this perspective <laughs> of the idea that, you know, men are somehow better than women. I'm not sure if you actually believe that or if you just think that society believes that, but at any rate, it's that perspective that allows people to take issues like that, like this, and so easily say that, oh yeah, well, it would have, it just, you know, would have been totally uncomparable. You couldn't have you couldn't have actually published this book with a female character. Mm-hmm. I I don't know. Well, here's one more email, and then we'll wrap it up. They, this this person disagreed with us. This is Rosie Twenty from Florida. Can we please talk about how effed up it is that MuggleCast, a male dominated podcast, thinks that the story would be worse if the main character was a girl? I don't think the story would have been any different if Harry was a female. Like you said, J.K. Rowling is a brilliant woman and would have had the same story in her head. I'd also like to touch on the fact that Micah said in the last episode that Voldemort couldn't be identified as any gender because he didn't know whether he, quote-unquote, got all his parts back. <laughs> nice one, Micah. That is funny. Since when is gender defined by what you have in your pants? There are plenty of transgendered men and women out there who would be offended by that statement. Your gender does not equal what is in between your legs. As Micah mentioned moments later, he was trying to lighten up the conversation a bit. So he wasn't serious about that point. Anyway, back to the email. That all being said, I really think you need a regular female on the podcast to give a better perspective on things. It would make your show more successful and give females in the audience someone to identify with. I remember back when you used to have a woman on the show whose name escapes me. (laughs) Hi, I'm Laura. How are you? (laughs) And thinking, wow, a girl who's just as nerdy as me. She's smart and not afraid to say your opinions. Awesome. But now I feel like every time a gender issue comes up on MuggleCast, the conversation is completely one-sided with no female insight. Okay, so she goes on a little bit more. But anyway, uh, Rosie, valid points. It it was kind of inappropriate for four guys to talk about. Well, it depends <laughs> how you were talking about it. I mean, well, were you talking about it the way that she's saying you were talking no, about it? No, she says we said were. the story. The story <laughs> would, no, but she's saying we said the story would be worse. The question is, would it have been as successful? Ah, oh, yes, which we said is a story. clearly financial consideration rather than a... 
uh, it would be worse because a female was in it, right? Which is what you right. Didn't say. I don't think we were saying that. I just you know, it, I don't know. Would MuggleNet exist? Would we be having this podcast right now? Right. The question's valid because Harry Potter is so popular. It is the most successful franchise of all time. So that's why we were asking so the, the question. So the question you're asking. asking is whether or not Emerson Sparts would have read Harry Potter if it was about a girl. <laughs> <laughs> Emma Sparts. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to make that show the show title and then see if you listen. Emma Spots, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Let's now get into chapter by chapter. This is a big chapter by chapter segment because we are wrapping up Goblet of Fire. We're looking at chapters 36 and 37. This is the penultimate chapter-by-chapter chapter series. Of course, we're, we're, we're going to go into Order of the Phoenix next. And some people emailed in and said, wait, you haven't done Half-Blood Prince yet. And we're going to skip Half-Blood Prince because... We analyzed it for our first 100 episodes, and that's enough. <laughs> so <laughs> we're not going to go through it again. That's so, true. Order Very of Things will be the last one, and Micah is going to start us off with Chapter 36. Yes, The Parting of the Ways. Um, so uh, just to kind of, I guess, remind everybody, what's just happened is they've uh, uncovered Barty Crouch Jr. being this imposter uh, for the last, you know, year or so at Hogwarts and uh, Dumbledore takes Harry up to his office to meet with Sirius but also to question Harry about the events that took place um, in the graveyard and uh, you know Dumbledore said something interesting to Harry he said if I thought I could help you by putting you into an enchanted sleep and allowing you to postpone the moment when you would have to think about what has happened tonight I would do it but I know better numbing the pain for a while will make it worse when you finally feel it so, I was wondering if this was a reference to his own experiences with what went on with his sister. That sounds right, yeah. Yeah, I would say so. Definitely. Because when he told Harry at King's Cross Station, you know, he was all like, can you f forgive me, can you f forgive an old man, you know, kind of, oh, it's taken a long time type of thing. Um, I think that's a good point. Yeah. Then, you know, as Harry begins to tell what what's happened, there's this moment where Fox comes over to him, and... It's described like Fox almost empowers Harry to be able to retell what happened in the graveyard, even though he's in such a weakened state. Um, my question was just, what kind of magic is it that allows Fox to do that? Hey, doesn't the presence of Fox kind of... Um... I don't know. It cha it just, doesn't well, it change he, your mood or something like that? He does have healing powers. Yeah. Um, and doesn't he actually heal him? I mean... In that he scene. does later on. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, it could also be a mental thing as well, and not just a physical one. Isn't he supposed to strike strike boldness into the hearts of the pure and weakness into the hearts of the horrible, or something like that? Didn't they Didn't they say that at some point? That's what he does. Perhaps that was. It sounds it. really. It sounds really good. Yeah. I don't know if he said it. <laughs> I, I didn't just make that up. I definitely got that from somewhere. Could I was going to say, been, you, um, you could write your own series. <laughs> I think it was Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. But I could be completely wrong. I honestly don't know. Perhaps I did just make that up. Mm. No, I think that... I I feel like that that seems to ring a bell. I mean, we know about the f the Phoenix Tears, but yeah. I can't specifically remember something about just the mere presence. Yeah. That's but I wouldn't be surprised. Maybe, maybe when the Phoenix song is also in the air. Yeah, no, it could oh, be because no, yeah, it says the, yeah, yeah. I think it's that. I think it said just song. like something warmed inside of him. Like he felt like this strength that he was able to carry on this conversation. Yeah, Jamie, you're right. I just looked it up. The song of the Phoenix gives strength and hope to those who sing it. To, to those it sings for, quote, increasing the courage of the pure of heart and striking fear into the hearts of the impure. Oh, yeah. Wow, look exact, at you, Jamie. Jamie. Oh, well, yeah, well, what can I say? What can I say? <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I, I got the le that from the lexicon, by the way. That That's my brain. Jamie has a brain. I just use the lexicon as a brain. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to call it Jamie's moments of inspiration or something like that. <laughs> uh, so Harry continues to tell uh, the story of what happened in the graveyard, and then if we get to the moment where uh, he tells him how Voldemort took his blood and now has his blood running through his veins and Dumbledore has that all important gleam of triumph that Harry thinks he sees for like a fleeting moment and this ended up being you know so much speculation about what this gleam of triumph was yeah. for so many years I guess until the final book was released but 
I mean, what exactly was the gleam of triumph, though? Was it just because he knew now that Voldemort could be defeated? Yeah, I think so. Isn't that what was later implied? I I think so. I also, mean, I mean, because, you know, Dumbledore was being, you know, a bit of a a slippery git, if you will, and, you know, putting Harry up as a pig to slaughter. Um, so I guess at this point he knew that they had some sort of plan they could work with. Yeah. It, it's just a shame Dumbledore was never really a good communicator until maybe the b- next book when he's like, Sit down, Harry. I'm about to tell you everything. Except he didn't and, actually and then, tell him right. everything. <laughs> right, <yeah. laughs> I remember we had fun with that. I think in book seven, we were like, oh, so he was lying that whole time. Or even the Half-Blood Prince, too. Or I wonder, or is it that, that Voldemort could never really kill Harry because Harry's protection was now inside of Voldemort? No, no, it is that, isn't it? Because he said that when, yeah, yeah, when he rose he and took his blood, he bound them together even more so than they were bound together before. And that's the gleam of triumph, because Dumbledore's plan was coming together. Yeah, but yeah. didn't he? wouldn't he also at that point have known, or at least had some idea, that one of Voldemort's Horcruxes went inside of Harry? Yes, yes. Well, he could have known that already, because when he tells Snape that um, that fateful night when a part of his soul latched to him, then he probably knew that, which means that him taking his blood and linking them further together binds them both to each other and binds them both to the same fate. Or something. Yeah, which means Harry has to... I don't know. Check the lexicon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, just kidding. When in doubt. Uh, yeah. Uh, so we learn that Harry and Voldemort's wands share the core of Fox's phoenix feather. And, uh, that, I mean, I think this is just more information, again, coming from Dumbledore that he's known for some time because he even says that Ollivander called him or messaged him, I guess. I don't think they have phones. Uh, and, uh, you know, let him know as soon as Harry purchased the wand that, you know, it, that it was the same, the twin of, of Voldemort's wand. Mm. Um, so after Harry finishes the story, Dumbledore takes him down to the hospital wing and, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of different events take place, but he ends up going to sleep, and his sleep is interrupted by arguing between Fudge and Professor McGonagall, and it's over the fact that not only did Fudge bring a Dementor into the Hogwarts, but it performed uh, the kiss on Barty Crouch Jr. And I wondered why did Fudge believe that he had any need for the assistance of a Dementor? You know, he had Snape. Dumbledore sent Snape to go down and get Fudge and, and to bring him up to the castle. But he could also have called for human beings. He could have called for any number of auras. He could have asked for Dumbledore. Why bring a Dementor other than to further the plot? He's an idiot. Yeah, he's it's, a, it's just, just... He's a coward as well, yeah. This is just another sign that, that, that Fudge is, is a messed up guy. And it's, and it's something to look forward to in Book 5 when we see him fall apart more. Because as and as we'll talk about in the next chapter, he you know nothing's ever reported about this in the prophet. So, right. so the parting of the ways begins as Fudge and now Dumbledore, who's joined in the conversation, argue with each other about Voldemort's return. And it said, you know, that Dumbledore kind of looks at Fudge with the same level of intensity that he did when he busted into Moody's office and saw you know, uh, the imposter Moody there, you know, essentially about to kill Harry. And it seems as if he's looking at Fudge as a real person, or, you know what I mean? Like, he's seeing him as who he really is for the first time. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't really like what he sees. But I Um, I think he doesn't like him because he's sort of obsessed with power, and he's obsessed with protecting his position and stuff, which is exactly what Dumbledore hates, because he knows that he can't trust himself with power, and it's typically the things that we don't like about ourselves that we don't like in other people. No, that's well, a good point. Yeah, and, Vol- and you know, Dumbledore is working hard to try to prove that Voldemort is back, and here's Fudge completely denying everything. I mean, it's got to be extremely frustrating. Yeah, it's it's an unbelievable amount of denial. I mean, even when Harry tries to give his own proof of you know, being in the graveyard and what he saw, you know, he names the Death Eaters that were there. And Fudge just simply passes it off as having read old reports of trials. Now, is Harry, who's, 
you know, at right now, what, 14 years old, really somebody who's been digging in the, uh, the old trial reports from the ministry and, and just randomly spewing out names of Death Eaters? You know, I mean, come on. That, it just shows how vain he is. And then McGonagall points out that the death of Cedric and Barty Crouch Sr., there are not deaths that were the work of a raving lunatic. And Fudge just says, well, I see no evidence to the contrary. I mean, the, he's just getting to the point now where he's really wearing blinders and, and not no, wanting to admit the truth. literally putting his head in the sand. I mean, I'm surprised he's even there, facing all this, uh, all, all these remarks from McGonagall and Dumbledore. Like, you know, if I were him, I just would have pieced out of there. If I wanted to hide from all this truth... Yeah, exactly. And he goes on to say, it seems to me that you're all determined to start a panic that will destabilize everything we have worked for these last 13 years. So that really says it all. I mean, he's more concerned about order and, you know, protecting his own position than he is about the of the future safety of the entire community. Um, and Dumbledore gives him the choice. He says, you can either be remembered as the minister who saved the wizarding world or the one who allowed Voldemort to return to That's power. That's a great line. Great line. And he's going to pick the latter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, well, otherwise we wouldn't have the the next few books. Well, really, though, what could have Fudge done if he was like, okay, yeah, I'm going to go, uh, you know, I'm going to save the wizarding world? What's what's he going to do? We all know Harry's the one who has to, to do it anyway. Yeah. He could have made so. it a bit easier for him. Yeah, he could have worked. He could have worked with him instead of against him. Ah, instead this is of true. you know turning the entire wizarding world against him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Fudge essentially threatens Dumbledore. Um, you know, he brings up the fact that he allowed him to hire a werewolf and he allowed him to keep Hagrid and he's allowed him to teach really whatever he wants to his students. And you know, this the old is turn all... the tables trick. Take the attention off of me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let's bring up all Dumbledore's problems. <laughs> yeah. So this and this was laying the groundwork for the Ministry to take over the school uh, oh, yeah. in in the next book. And you know, but it's like Dumbledore's been teaching students the same thing for many many years. So why do you think just now it's it's okay to step in and and change his teaching process? Uh, I don't know if he's that actually scared of Fudge. Is he like Fudge is so like impotent in his power he just doesn't seem to have any actual power in or anything to him at all um and also like what's how's he going to stop dumbledore hiring werewolves and keeping hagrid i mean he's not is he breaking laws i guess he is kind of breaking laws if hagrid keeps his wand but it just seems like an empty threat to be honest i don't think dumbledore would be scared of that yeah, and and maybe Fudge had made clear to him in the past that he wasn't cool with it, but he'll let it slide anyway. Yeah, maybe because yeah. you know maybe him and Dumbledore ha- had a good, re- better relationship. So maybe this is his way of being like, you know, I trusted you. You 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 were doing these things, and I, I let them slide. And now you're kind of turning your back against me. And you know, in the meantime, I've been good to you. So right. what the, what the hell? So it's it's exactly what you're saying. It's like he's turning it all on Dumbledore now instead of it being about yeah Fudge. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, and probably the most telling thing that happens in this entire scene is, you know, Fudge starts to walk away, and Snape kind of pulls him back, and you know, shows him the dark mark, and and it's still burning, not as bright as it was before, but you know, he mentions that's why Karkaroff ran off, and but Fudge just refuses to believe. It's it's almost like you could take so, all the evidence and put it in front of him. You could bring Voldemort and put it in front of him. He's still not going to believe it's Voldemort. Well, he doesn't order the phoenix when he sees him. Right. <laughs> so, did Fudge genuinely not believe he was back, or was he just saying this so he could kind of, I don't know, maybe focus on it himself, take a look at the evidence and really think about it, talk with other people in the ministry? Like, it, it just seems impossible that he genuinely, deep down, believes he's he's not back. Mm, I don't know. I don't, I don't think he believes that. Or, or perhaps he, he has told himself that he believes it, and then he believes it if you know what i mean but deep down i think he's so scared of it he won't even entertain the the thought maybe yeah i agree with that yeah i think he's just he believes harry to be nothing more than a good storyteller and he thinks that dumbledore is buying into the the crackpot theories that harry is coming up with and you know he even mentions not you know giving all the information over to the ministry that that's gone on at the school 
you know, and the things that Harry, you know, the fact that he can speak to snakes and the fact that, you know, there's been all these incidents that have happened and, you know, they've kind of been pushed under the rug by Dumbledore. So, but, you know, as soon as Fudge leaves, Dumbledore puts his plan into motion almost right away. Um, you know, he tells Sirius to take his human form because this whole time he's been as a dog and he makes him and Snape shake hands. And, you know, this was one of the scene that I would have liked to see in the movies. I mean, all this stuff is completely cut out of, of Goblet of Fire. There's, there's, you know, no mention of any of this. And, you know, one of the people that Dumbledore mentions that Sirius should go start rounding up, you know, he talks about Lupin, he talks about others, but it was Arabella Fig. And, you know, I didn't know, did anybody catch this the first time reading, knowing that she was the one who I was didn't. looking over Harry? Oh, I didn't. Yeah. I remembered her name. Yeah, I was like, hmm. That was I was also like eleven <laughs> when I first <laughs> read this book. So, right, yeah. So, um, you know, and then he tells Snape uh, that uh, basically, you know what you have to do, and I'm assuming that he's going back to have to, you know, work within Voldemort's inner circle. And uh, the chapter just ends with Harry being overcome with so much emotion as what's taken place over the course of these last few hours. And, you know, Mrs. Weasley is shown as being the motherly figure comforting him. And, uh, you know, so, so you really get to see the relationship between the two of them. And then there's also this brief moment where Hermione catches something at the window and it kind of breaks up all the emotion that's taking place. And that's really how the chapter ends. And this is kind of a transition into book five, too, because it's, you know, we see hangry, uh, Harry very angry overall in book five. And, uh, you know, so Joe pointing out that Harry is overcome with emotion, it, it kind of leads in nicely to the next book. So anyway, the final chapter, chapter 37, the beginning, Harry's still trying to recover from all the hardship that had been going on. And <laughs> to, to fuel the fire, he, he then meets with the Diggories, who very kindly don't blame Harry. And believe Cedric died quick and painlessly, which was comforting to them. Uh, since it was a Vada Kedavra, it was kind of, you know, one shot and boom. There was no slow, painful, uh, emotional death, I guess you could say. Ron tells Harry that Dumbledore wants him to go back to the Dursleys for at least the beginning of the summer. Uh, presumably, so Harry has the house's prote protection until Dumbledore works some plans out, maybe? Yeah, until he comes to get him, yeah. Yeah, and Harry was confused by this. Um, so, and, and then, then I kind of forgot about this through all this classes are still going on. And I thought that was kind of odd. Harry should have just gotten I the rest of the year off. This. this is one of those things where they just skip like a load of schooling and it doesn't seem to be a problem that they're going to be way behind. It, it's like the fact that they don't ever wash or like brush their teeth <laughs> <laughs> or like, you know, or eat healthy stuff. They always like. Harry helped himself to to a couple of fried tomatoes and sausages and stuff and like <laughs> and chocolate frogs. And chocolate and frogs, and... yeah. They just or like exercise or do anything. They just they just seem to exist. <laughs> how, how many classes could possibly be going on? Because doesn't the third task happen on June the twenty something? I mean, how long does the term th last for these guys? I thought they start like don't they go until the end of June? Like I don't know. I mean, I'm not. I, I don't know how Briggs. You don't go to in, Hogwarts. Yeah, well, I don't know how <laughs> Briggs work in England or in the UK. Jamie, I don't, us. I don't know. I don't know. Well, it depends, really. I, I think they yeah. go to about July twentieth for a normal school. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, I guess they still would be going on. In fact, you'd think that would be exam time, really. Um, yeah, around that kind of time. But yeah, yeah, it says the third task was on June the twenty fourth. Twenty fourth. Yeah. But, their curricula curriculum could not have been complete, I think, basically, is what we're trying to say <laughs> with all these classes being missed. And, of course, Harry can't focus. It's just it's just very, you know, but then again, Jamie, it's like, well, if they didn't have classes at all, where, where would have been their, like, home base? I mean, the classes do add a lot to the series. It is oh, yeah. interesting, you know. And the books are defined by the school years, pretty much. But what I don't get is if I, when I was, like, 11, instead of going to school to learn stuff, I just went to a wizarding school. I, I'd, be, I'd be pretty stupid, but I'd know how to cast spells, you know? Surely they need to also do <laughs> normal subjects. Maths and science. Yeah, well, I guess that's English. what, you know, elementary school was for before you turned 11. I don't know, but even did, though that's still pretty young. But they didn't do that. 
what? Didn't, didn't she say they were just homeschooled before they were 11? Well, all of them. Yeah, I'm pretty sure she said that. Cause, like, so, where so would they're they... just stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, where would they go? Yeah, it's true. <laughs> How can Harry even string a sentence <laughs> together? <laughs> <laughs> no, he went to school though. Yeah, he, did. he No, he went he, to school. He, like, yeah, yeah. How does you know? I don't know. How does like um, what's his name? Neville. How how does? I mean, he is quite stupid. <laughs> how does he string a sentence together? How does anyone know anything? Well, you about learn to the talk world? through. You don't need school to learn to okay, talk. Okay, okay. I, I get the point you're making, but okay. Perhaps I'm taking it too far. But like, just how does he know his uh, times tables? Yeah, yeah. How does he do any basic like? Sums. They, well, I guess he doesn't need to. They just point their ones. That's lazy, isn't it? <laughs> Akio eight times seven. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you're saying Potter promotes obesity? Is that what you're saying? In a very, and very, stupidity. very roundabout way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So moving along in the chapter, uh, Hagrid talks to the trio and says, "Great man, Dumbledore. As long as we've got him, I'm not worried." And it, it made me kind of flash forward to Half Blood Prince because I don't recall any specific comments from Hagrid about Dumbledore's death. Obviously, you know, as we know now after reading this quote from him, D- D- Hagrid must have been scared crapless when Dumbledore died. I, unless he really trusted Harry at that point to take over for what Dumbledore was trying to do, or he knew this was a step towards defeating Voldemort. At the leaving feast, Dumbledore makes a big speech about what exactly happened to Cedric, and there are no house colors in the Great Hall. Uh, the, 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 that day was, you know, a tribute to Cedric, and they did a good job with this in the movie. I think they had just, I don't know if they had black, but did they have like. I think they had black. There were Hogwarts, oh, I think. They had an H on them. Yeah, so I remember. Unity. Right. Unity. Type okay, thing. yeah. And that, that was a nice touch. I'm glad they did that in the movie. And Dumbledore flat out says that Cedric was killed by Lord Voldemort, which make, makes everyone gasp, and everybody's very taken aback by Dumbledore's direct statements. Dumbledore does a toast for Cedric, and then also does a toast for Harry for getting away from Voldemort, as well as bringing back Cedric's body. So, the feast wraps up. It's a very emotional time. There are a lot of goodbyes that we get to see as everybody leaves Hogwarts, and Ron finally gets his autograph from Crumb, so it's kind of like that little plot point is tied up at the end. <laughs> and on the train back to King's Cross, Harry and Hermione note that the Daily Prophet, as I mentioned earlier, makes no mention of Voldemort's return. They suspect that Fudge is trying to keep it under wraps. They don't, they, and uh, the, pro- the Prophet didn't mention Cedric's death either. And, you know, it's a sign of what's to come in Order of the Phoenix. Can I just ask, the minis- do hmm? are Crumb and Hermione, I mean, they are kind of dating by this point, aren't they? Like, kind of, sort of, maybe seeing each other, aren't they? Yeah, because later on, doesn't Ginny remark that they, like, snogged or something? Yeah, well, I don't see why Ron would go up and get his autograph. It would be like, like the girl that he loves going up and getting her new boyfriend's autograph. It would be really... Surely you wouldn't want to do that. It's really weird. Well, he's still a, f- he's still a fan of Crumb, though. I, and it kind of wraps up that point. You know, at the beginning of this book, we see that Ron is very into Victor Crumb, and he wanted to ask for an autograph, I believe, at one point, and it didn't build up the guts to do it. I guess so. so. It just seems a bit... I guess he's a fan of his, yeah, yeah. I guess that's why. But still, it just seems a bit weird. Um... So Hermione reveals that she figured out how Rita Skeeter was eavesdropping. And I think this is what you mentioned at the end of the chapter, right? Uh, yeah. Hermione catches something by the window. Uh, so what had happened was Rita is an unregistered animagus who can turn into a beetle. Hermione has captured her and is keeping her in a jar, and Hermione shows everybody the beetle. And Hermione says she put a jar on the class so she can't transform. But uh, And I guess this means you can't apparate as a, in your animagus form. But how do you change because back? If, if I mean, a beetle's pretty stupid. I don't see how it can cast a spell. <laughs> what well, you mean? Oh, I see. To to tr- to to apparate or to Tra- turn back into a human? Transform. Like if your if your animal form is an amoeba or other form of single celled organism, you can't be clever enough to think, "Oh, I'm going to transform back." So you're just- well, you must you must still have your brain because as the beetle, Rita was taking notes and <laughs> yes, you know, very the true, scoop. very true. So you'd be an extremely clever amoeba. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Did anyone else feel stupid for not catching this after no, book three? I, I didn't. It's quite like, clever. No, it was, but I mean, especially with book three, like 
everything with Peter Pettigrew. Yeah. Like, I feel uh, like uh, true, the groundwork true, yeah. was very much laid. And then later I was like, oh, man, like... She did it again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what what did you have any theories as to how Rita was doing it before you found out no, she was a beat? No, I had no idea because I, I'm I, apparently I mean, obviously she, on the same ahead. level as the amoeba. There could Miss have been Hakuna. a lot of options, though. She could have had some magical little tracking device on them or something. I mean, and you know, we're still getting introduced to a lot of magical things in the series. So who knows what Joe could have dreamt up other than this beetle idea. Yeah. Draco uh, comes in. They're still on the Hogwarts Express. Draco comes in and tells Harry that he's chosen the wrong side and Hermione and Ron are going to be the first to go. And it's really silly to, to, you know, so we're really establishing now that Draco is on the bad side. This is not going to get better between the two. Um, it, it seems silly to think at this point that Draco is actually for what has been going on recently, and he's still able to go to Hogwarts and all this. I mean, he should be considered a serious threat to the school if he's in there threatening fellow students. Yeah. I, and the other thing is just going back to what you said about it not being in the newspaper. Like, that's pretty big. I mean, a kid died at, at your only local wizarding school and you're covering it up. There's got to be other forms of, like, newspapers, though. Well, the internet. Surely there are bloggers. <laughs> there was no internet back then when this took place. I mean, in the there 90s? was AOL, but well, and then there was AOL dial-up, but nobody was using the internet. Yeah, but I don't know. I don't know Andrew, we never see people... electronics in the Wizarding World. Come on. <laughs> okay, but why not? Like, like there's got to be a way to like tell people about it. Like, I'd have thought news would spread incredibly quickly when you can like send a Patronus to a hundred people in one go. It's like, you know, whispers, Chinese whispers, but with Patronuses, you send like. Well, maybe word was getting around other ways. I guess. I yeah. guess, yeah. And like in Deathly Hallows, we see the the radio station that they're that they're using yes. to talk over. So, yeah, but that's that's old. It radio. is. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they so Fred and George help the trio hex Draco, Crab, and Goyle. They arrive at King's Cross. Harry gives his Tri Wizard winnings to Fred and George for their joke shop. And they say it must be around a thousand galleons, and I did the calculations online. It's that that means it's worth about ten thousand U.S. dollars. That's quite a it lot. It is, yeah. Harry thinks to himself, and so and I remember reading this for the first time and being so like touched that Harry was giving away his money. I thought that was like really nice and really cool to see that friend George were going to be opening up their a real joke shop for them. It just shows their growth in the series, how they're going to be they're they're about to be businessmen, businessmen. Harry, uh, so the, the book ends with Harry thinking to himself that what, whatever will come will come, and I'll have to face it when it does. And that is Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Ah, so that's another book done in our chapter by chapter series. And, uh, a lot of people ask sometimes if, like, we can cut up all the chapter by chapter segments and insert them into one giant episode, but. That would be so good. Cool. One book. Each yeah, book. Like, like 30 <laughs> hours. <laughs> but. Yeah, that's just download the episodes. Andrew's busy. Well, and, you know, like that just seems a little pointless. So in a couple episodes, we will begin Order of the Phoenix. Uh, probably not the next episode, because that'll probably be a trailer, trailer review show. Uh, but we'll do it in the future. Anyway, moving along. Jamie, could you give us some Make the Connections, please? It's been so long. I certainly can. I certainly can. Okay, Andrew, since, you know, you don't really like this when I give you tough ones, you you know, uh, I've got a quite a simple one for you. Okay. Um, so, Andrew, please could you make a connection between Harry Potter and Seth MacFarlane? The creator of Family Guy. Yes. Hmm. And American Dad. <laughs> Do you like American Dad? Uh, I don't think really. it's as I don't good. Think it's family Guy. Yeah, you know, the characters are a bit are a bit weak. Family Guy is awesome, though, obviously. Uh, that's kind of hard. I mean, I guess the, my first thing I would think of is looking at the family, but the, the Griffin family does not really relate to the Potter family or any of the others. You can't compare like Stewie and Voldemort. Come on. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that's, a good, that's a good point. Stewie, Stewie is out to kill everybody. Uh, even though he has not like had some master plan to protect himself from being killed, he hasn't planted any horcruxes in anyone. But yes, Voldemort and Stewie uh, have the connection that they're both very evil. And then there's also Brian and Sirius. Uh, they're both dogs who look out. Oh yeah, yeah. nice, <laughs> nice. They're, That's very good. <laughs> they're both dogs who look out for their best friends, and uh, you know. It, Brian, Brian's always there for Stewie, sometimes Peter, sometimes Lois. And you know what? They're both looking for love. 
They they they're both always looking for love, and they can never seem to find it. Okay, that's a bit weak. Of Why? <laughs> Sirius didn't find love. We know he wants some love. Where was he looking for love? Uh, I'm sure deep down. We just if we got a backstory on Sirius, we would find something. Oh right, okay. sounds like <laughs> uh, all right, a yes, really bad yes. fan fiction. Yeah, it does. Yeah. All right, Laura. Your one is to make a connection between Harry Potter and selling your collection of Pokemon cards. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Well, I guess if you sold your collection of Pokemon cards, you might accidentally sell like a really rare one. Like, what is it? The holographic thing? Charizard. Yeah, Char- yeah. There Charizard. We go. I got that. I got that in in a pack once. Oh my god! My mom bought me a pack, <laughs> and and I opened it, and there was one in there, and it was worth fifteen pounds. So <laughs> that is a lot of money. I couldn't believe pounds. it. I was so happy. That was exciting to get the Charizard. Do you have a license to sell Pokemon cards? No, I didn't, so I just had to keep it. <laughs> uh, um, oh sorry, yeah. there I go. No, no, no. So you, uh, you accidentally give away your holographic Charizard, and then later some poor kid has to go hunt it down because, I, I don't know, he has a reason. But anyway, that's like Harry having to hunt down Horcruxes. Ooh, that, that is pretty good. And also, you could talk about Hagrid and the dragon having to let the dragon go, maybe, with Charizard. And yeah. something mm. there, maybe, I don't know. Uh, maybe, sort of. Um, yeah, very nice. And, Micah, I, I always save the stupid one for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Is this like Tiger you... Woods and something? <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah. I forget Micah, what it please... was. Please, would you ma- make a connection between Harry Potter and, uh, uh, <laughs> sorry, and asking a homeless person if they've ever watched an episode of Two and a Half Men? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Mike, I'll, I'll help you get started. A homeless man would be, what the hell is Two and a Half Men? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because it's almost it's almost like asking somebody who d- who doesn't know anything about Harry Potter what Harry Potter is. Because how would a homeless man, as Andrew pointed out, know anything about two and a half? I know, men? I know how, I know how. Because he's homeless, he sort of walks the streets, uh, being sad, and he walks past one of those shops that has TVs f- facing outwards, and he walks past it every day, and that sh- show is always on. So he goes inside and says, "Oh, that wasn't really that funny. Who? What was that?" Mike, just say what I said. Well, I basically did. Oh. All right. Yeah. Well, well, that so was very good. good. Okay. Good job, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's how we play Make the Connection. Why don't we, why don't we uh, if anyone has a really good one for that last one, email it in. Perhaps we could read a couple on the next show. Sure. Uh, it's time for Muggle Mail now. This first one comes from Eric Copes14, Indiana. He's a little disappointed with us. Hearing you guys talk about the changes in Part 2 on Episode 225 has really concerned me. Not only with the film itself, but with you guys. Don't you guys think you have a sort of responsibility to speak for the fans? I mean, there are so many of us who would love to speak to Heyman or the other filmmakers about our concerns, but you guys are the ones who get the opportunity. So when David Heyman asks, did you like Part 2, then it's not your job just to say yes. You need to say when you have problems. This movie was our last shot at getting everything right, and when you have the power to step forward and say something, you have the responsibility to step forward and say something. Woot Spider-Man, okay? But seriously, it was a test screening, which means there are still changes to be made, and you could have made a difference even if it was just a small one. No, you couldn't have. Yeah, I don't, ha- I, <laughs> I don't do like to be... I don't like to be negative Nancy, but... Okay, uh, what Eric's, Eric the, Eric Cope is, is talking about is Eric Skull, or was it... Yeah, Eric Skull... Who, who, did Eric even talk to the, Heyman about the movie? Well, no, I think what Micah? he's saying is that... Uh, okay... Oh, no, well, no. the problem was this, you talked to him. It's all mixed up. Yeah, he he's mixing up everything that happened, I think, is is the problem. Heyman said to me, I hope you enjoy part two, to which to which I said, you know, basically, thank you. I'm sure I will. I had, I think he's thinking that I had already seen part two in Chicago, but it was, right. in fact, you and Eric who saw it in Chicago. And here's the other thing. I don't mean ne- to be negative, Nancy. You know, yes, we do get the privilege of talking to Heyman and other people involved in the films, and it's awesome. And we, I like to think we do ask them some good questions, especially around the premieres and the junkets. But if we were to say to him, if I were to have gone up to him and been like, Heyman, you got to change so-and-so. I, I don't want to spoil it for anybody who doesn't want to be spoiled. 
What's he going to do? Be like, okay, uh, yeah, I'm going to go back and we're going to spend $10 million to change all those Yeah, they're going to take this like, guys, Andrew Sims <laughs> <laughs> tell me. <laughs> tell me or we else need to he's going to complain this. on MuggleCast. Yeah, exactly. You'd be like, hey, David, welcome to our show. What the bleep were you thinking when you did <laughs> yeah, this? Yeah, so, but So then our our chance to really get in there and speak for the fans is when we can ask direct questions about the decisions that they made. We can't tell them to make decisions, but... You know, around premiere time or the junket time, we will definitely ask them questions about scenes that we had a problem with. Yeah, and I mean, and we'll and get the answers. Yeah, but we uh, can't make changes. They make. The, I mean, they give those answers. They they're not shy about responding to why they cut something out or they change yeah. something. They tend to be very confident in all the choices they make because there is a lot of discussion that goes into all these changes. So, anyway, Laura, could you read the next email from Carrie? Sure. The next email comes from Carrie, 48 of Illinois, and she writes, Hi, MogulCast. Thank you for your podcasts. I really enjoy listening to them. My 13-year-old son and I are great fans. Oh, that's really cute. In regards to Heyman's comments about the death of Peter Pettigrew, I heard the audio of the comments he made about it. It wasn't that he said that the death of Pettigrew was juvenile, but how it would look on film. He was afraid that showing a metal hand killing himself would have looked very would have looked juvenile or corny, like the old B-horror films. <laughs> yeah. He said they felt that there was no way they could have made it look authentic and serious. I don't know if I believe that, to be honest with you. Like, you gave him the hand in the fourth movie... So, and, and you see it in part one. Yeah, it's. I don't know. Like, I, I get I'm it. I'm sure they I, could have done it, couldn't they? Like, I agree. I'm sure I they could have done it in a cool way, like just a like a really silvery like hand against his will. I I don't know. I mean, it doesn't have to be like the phantom hand from hell. You know, hell. Yeah, but I mean, I understand it if if they just didn't feel it was right for the audience. But I think they could have done it, couldn't they? I mean, the I think they thing, could have. The only thing that I think of is, I think like the costume and just general makeup for that character in the movies came out kind of goofy anyway, um, because they were trying to make him look like a rat, <laughs> you know, post like post animagus form, and I, I don't know. I could just imagine his face when he's choking himself, and I think it would have been probably really funny, and not, I don't know. Oh, what's the actor's name again? Timothy Spall. Yeah, Timothy Spall? Timothy Spall, I think. Yeah, Timothy, Timothy Spall, yeah, that's yeah. Right. yeah. I think he could have pulled it off. I mean, he did a great job of portraying Pettigrew in these movies. And he has that weird, eerie look on his face all the time. I think that would have fit in well with him choking himself. Yeah, I agree. I don't know. Uh, I understand where they're coming from. And also, I, I because, also because these movies, there have been a few occasions where they've done things that haven't quite worked out and have left people laughing like mm. the he was their friend speech <laughs> um, so. they should have at least tried to shoot it and see how it turned out i mean yeah. and maybe they did for all what we if know. it was a shadow you know like what if you saw the hand like attacking him that would have been cheesy <laughs> yeah that would have been that's yeah like, that would have been that's so like the cheesy. first movie when they were too cheap to show uh it wasn't in the first five minutes they didn't actually show McGonagall transforming. They just showed her shadow. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. It I, that was so, kind of... It looks so crappy. Really? Yeah. But, I mean, back in 2001, that was kind of... I don't know. I would have I would have believed it more if he said something like, we didn't want to have deaths back-to-back, -back, you know, killing Pettigrew and Dobby in such a short period of time. Or something yeah, that like that. Yeah, that sense. Yeah. The only but thing that gonna... I don't like about it is... I don't know if they're going to kill him in part two. Because well, no, then... that's, that's the point of this whole yeah, conversation. They, they don't. They don't at all? No, no. You don't even see him. You see him in a brief flashback, but that's it. Yeah, because that's stupid then. Because he'd be yeah. the only marauder who survives, and he... Okay, whatever. And you wasted money giving him, on special effects, giving him the hand and two all movies. for nothing! You could have put in a house elf for that. <laughs> Jamie, could you read the next email from Liz... Yep, this is from Liz20 from Santa Barbara, California. I was just listening to episode 225, and I wanted to clarify what you guys said about the duel between Harry and Voldemort. When Voldemort puts the Imperius curse on Harry, he wants Harry to answer n no, that he doesn't want to be crucioed anymore. This is Voldemort's way of trying to get Harry to beg for mercy. However, to the shock of Voldemort and the Death Eaters, Harry overcomes the curse and instead yells, I won't. Just wanted to clarify this point. Love the show and keep up the awesome work. 
Um, yes, that does sound like Voldemort, to be honest. What, did you guys say that, what, that he wanted him to, um, say that he did want it to happen? Well, we were wondering, we were wondering, because it seemed like Harry was trying to resist, but it may have overcome him. I, I don't, we were, I, I, I was kind of like going in circles with that, with that discussion. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. And Mike, a final email today is from Roy22 of Seattle. And he says, I was struck by something when you guys covered the Beretta Serum chapter in the latest episode. As soon as Dumbledore stuns fake Moody, he orders Winky fetched, which makes me think he knew that the perpetrator was Barty Crouch Jr. Clearly, he didn't realize that Moody was evil until he took Harry away earlier that night. So how did Dumbledore come to this conclusion? Also, Bertha was described as being very nosy and inquisitive, and the memory charm placed on her by Voldemort turned her into a mess. Surely someone would have noticed that immediate change, but then again, this is the Ministry. P.S. You forgot to mention Frank Bryce coming out of Voldemort's wand. P.S. 2. Why are you not doing a chapter-by-chapter on Half-Blood Prince and Deathly Hallows? Keep it up. Um, well, where do we start with that? PS2, we we are going to do one on the final book, aren't we? We already did. We already did. Oh, right. Oh. Yeah, so, after, oh, right. right after it came out. Oh, uh, yes. All right. Um, PS, then. <laughs> Guys, you forgot to mention Frank Bryce coming out of Voldy's Wand. You know what? What, what yeah, say I'm you? Yeah, I'm sorry. That, that was a mistake on my part. And it's a good point wait, wait, about Bertha Jorgens. What? But I thought she didn't go back to the Ministry. I thought it was such... The memory charm was so powerful, she just went crazy and then no one found her. Or did she go back? That's a good point. I thought she was just kind of lost out in the, you know, Albania. What about her point about uh, Dumbledore knowing to get Winky? So wait, so wait. When he when he saw that Moody took Har- Harry away, he knew that he was evil, but did he know that it was Barty Crouch Jr. then? I don't know that he could have. That's the thing. He knew that it wasn't the real Moody. That much he knew, because he knew the real Moody never would have removed him. He says something like this, never would have removed him from Dumbledore's sight. sight. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he tells him to go, f- or he tells Snape, I think, to go get Moody, or to go get Winky, um, before he transforms back, which is weird. See, here's the thing about Dumbledore that kind of irks me. It's always, like, implied slightly that he has a general idea of who the bad guy is, and he doesn't really do anything about it. (laughs) (laughs) That is true, yeah. He's just like, ah, whatever. Hey, by the way, Snape, keep an eye on Quirrell. Will you, like, what? Come on, dude. It's That's like, why he's such a weird character, Dumbledore. <laughs> yeah, he just doesn't he doesn't do shit. He's always got he's, he's, he's got all this power and stuff, and you'd think he'd, you know, like like try and do a bit more. Actually, that's really harsh considering what he did do. But I I do know what you mean. I think I expressed myself in the wrong way, but well, I know what you mean. And we've talked about you know the whole pig for slaughtered thing too. It's just like Dumbledore yes, yeah, just keeps yeah. setting up Harry. So uh, to wrap things up today, Twitter question of the week. We ask this to people who follow us on Twitter, twitter.com, twitter.com slash MuggleCast. We asked, what did you think of the part one DVD, which we just talked about earlier? Letessia Scott wrote, I loved On the Green. It was great seeing the Phelps twins and Rupert and Tom. They were adorable together. See, that was one of those things. There was a segment on the DVD where, like, it's a golfing segment. But I'm just like, that's such filler. Like, just give me more behind-the-scenes content. Not them golfing. Yeah, you know, one good thing, though, that I did learn from some of the events that have been going on the last couple of weeks for this DVD launch is they eventually they are going to put out bloopers, which I know a lot of people have been asking about. It's like we have all these DVDs and you know, all these Ultimate Editions, and it doesn't seem like there's any bloopers. Everybody wants to see the funny moments. But yeah, the, the reasoning that they gave was, like, at the, at the beginning, the cast was so young, so they didn't want to... You know, embarrass them. I, I guess like that. That but makes sense. But they've been keeping all these bloopers over the course of the years, and they cool. said eventually they'll release them in some form. UJ the Awesome said, "I bought the Blu-ray and I like the Maximum Movie Mode, and other features were great too. Totally worth buying." Victoria P thirty nine forty nine. I'm glad they added the deleted scenes on the DVD, especially the Harry Dudley one. The creation of the ha- ha- Seven Harrys was amazing. DevPod wrote, the deleted scenes all had so many emotional pauses in them. Glad they're deleted. Would have slowed the movie more than usual. That, that is true. 
And finally, Arwin Evanstar11 wrote, I wish the Blu-ray features were also on DVD, but I guess that's what happens when you try and be cheap and not buy a Blu-ray player. <laughs> Blu-ray is the future. Jamie, get with it. Get your licenses in order. <laughs> oh, I don't have a Blu-ray expensive. either. Laura, do you? Mm, no, I have Blu-ray at home, but not not in my apartment, no. But see, see, here's the thing. like They're essentially forcing you to buy the Blu-ray player because all the good stuff now is going on the Blu-ray. And, and then, Micah, and then in, in 10 years, something new exactly. will come out, like holographic DVDs, and then I'll have a, I'll have a Blu-ray player and 400 Blu-ray DVDs. But that's, Blu-ray discs. That, that's technology, guys. It changes. You're either with it or you're in the Stone Age. So Yeah, Andrew, and you are a fanboy. <laughs> not a, what do you think? I'm a Blu-ray fan? Well, yeah, I have to agree. It's very stupid that the special features are only for the Blu-ray. Now, I've heard that there's also, but it's exclusively at Walmart, a DVD version. But you can only get it at Walmart, which is just silly. They're obviously really trying to push the Blu-ray combo pack. Um, I don't know if they get a kickback from from Blu-ray players or something. I don't know. Something weird kickback. is going on there. Anyway, so that's it for the show this week. I'd like to remind everybody about the website, MuggleCast.com. If you click on Contact at the top, you can uh, find a feedback form where you can contact us, send in your thoughts about anything that we talked about on the show today. Also, on the right side of MuggleCast.com, you can find links to our iTunes page, uh, our Twitter, our Facebook, and Tumblr. So thank you, everyone, for listening. I'm Andrew Sims. I'm Jamie Lawrence. I'm Laura Thompson. And I'm Micah Tannenbaum. And we'll see you next time for episode 227. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.